Hey there, this is Marshall Hilton, and you are listening to Nasty Neil on the station of decapitation without your head.com. Go get him, Neil. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Patrick McGee, writer and director and star, in a way, of Primal Rage coming out Tuesday's 27th Fathom of Events. We'll talk about that in a minute. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Honestly, I love Primal Rage. Uh, I always, I'm always interested in Bigfoot stuff and a lot of the movies, eh, but there has been a few good ones last few years, but Primal Rage, I thought was, uh, was tremendous. It was one was a big surprise to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. There's, um, definitely, a a big fascination with Bigfoot in general. And, um, it's a trippy, uh, you know, tricky subject matter, really. Uh, every, seems like everyone yeah. has your their, Bigfoot's you know, very, very neat. Yes, I definitely, when I set out to do my, kind of my take on Bigfoot, the whole purpose was to make it uniquely different. And, you know, it, the, the movie's version of what, what I think a Bigfoot could be or should be. Or... Now, is your take on Bigfoot based on any, any legends that you know of, or is it kind of a combination of things? How, how did you come up with your version of Bigfoot? Um. Well, there's the there's the kind of traditional lore that people have for Bigfoot that I think is you know your generalized version of what people think of Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a Yeti or any kind of hominid is. And then specifically with mine, I um, tried to get into as much kind of Native American versions of mm-hmm. Bigfoot, and uh, and then kind of from there, I mean, I had. I, I've spent well over 10 years on this film, just in development, just kind of tinkering around with the idea of making the the creature itself and then developing the screenplay. And it just kind of evolved um, from, you know, one kind of elementary level of what I would think a Bigfoot was to, I just kind of added, kept adding things. And uh, then when I added my uh, co-writer, Jay Lee, to the mix to help me really uh, draft out a nice screenplay. I mean, man, he, he brought a whole nother element to the, to the Bigfoot, which we call Oma. Um, and just kind of added layers to where by the time we finished it, you know, it was a whole, it was, it was a lot more uh, to it than I had originally intended. Cool. Now, oh, is, uh, oh, is Oma something you guys created or is that a real legend or real day of term oh, for Bigfoot? Oh, Oma is a real legend. Um, I can't remember the name the, the the tribe, the specific tribe that calls that their specific Bigfoot Oma. Um, so it, it's a real name of a Bigfoot type being. Um, so there's some truth there. Uh, other than that, what what he looks like and what he's doing in the film is pretty much completely original and made up and a combination of a lot of different things from films yeah. past. Now, now, were you were you yourself always interested in Bigfoot, or was it something you started to uh, get into when you decided to make the movie? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I saw, of course, for me the the first Bigfoot movie was uh, Harry and the Hendersons, <laughs> uh-huh. and I, I was really getting up, into yeah. yeah, I was really getting into makeup effects and monsters and liking how all that you know how the technology that worked and they you know was big in the eighties and that movie came out. And, you know, it's a family fun film, but just beautifully done. You know, it's kind of the quintessential Bigfoot suit and it's just so expressive. And so that really caught my eye as far as what, you know, about Bigfoot and, you know, that kind of character. And then coincidentally, um, that summer, summer of 1987, I think it was that early June, I think Harry and Henderson's came out. And then just a couple weeks later, Predator came out. <laughs> with uh another cool you know biped creature oh, and uh nice. it was like the one two punch of those two films i think has always been in the back of my head and i've always felt this kind of need to combine the two you know with uh with predator a kind of hunting evil creature mm-hmm. that uses technology and weapons and tools and then obviously the traditional you know bigfoot the your furry hominid creature and i kind of felt like i've always had that in me since i was little yeah. to try to 
find a way to combine the two. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I actually mentioned to uh, to Marshall that when I watched uh, the movie, I definitely got uh, a Predator vibe to it. Not that it's not like a derivative of Predator or anything like that, but it definitely has, you know, that kind of vibes, like you said, uh, especially with the hunters, you know, the, the hunters uh, being hunted. Yeah, big, big time. The, the middle act is very much Predator. Uh, I'm very aware of that. It was on purpose. Uh, a huge fan of that movie. Uh, that I'd switch it up, do it a, a little bit differently, uh, different circumstances, but it, it is without a doubt uh, an homage to Predator. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then it ha- Go on, I'm sorry. No, go for it. I was just saying about, uh, about Predator and hunting. Do you have a view on, on hunting itself? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I do and I don't. Um, I know uh, personally for me, I, I don't hunt. And uh, I could see it. I could see hunting as a means to an end as far as, uh, you know, t- kind of what the title of the movie is, you know, it can get primal. And uh, if you're going to, you know, hunt for, for fun, I don't, that doesn't fall into my, my uh, liking necessarily, just because it's personally something I don't think I could do. Mm-hmm. So with my film and with the, the group of hunters, I guess, consciously or subconsciously, I kind of designed it the way I did to have things turn out the way they do with our group of hunters. It's kind of uh, my nature's revenge film, I guess you could say. <laughs> Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, there's a kind of a fine line there with hunting and, uh, you know, if you're going to hunt game and, and, and use the animal for, um, you know, it's fur or to eat it and use it for all of its, uh, all, everything mm-hmm. it brings. I'm all for that. That's fine. Yeah. But, you know, I'm kind of foot in foot out when it comes to hunting. Yeah. Yeah. I would actually be on the, the same, the same, uh, way they're hunting for, you know, sustenance or, uh, or uh, even to use the things like tools, like like uh, like the Oma does in the movie, uh, like I said, just hunting for sport or for uh, trophies. I think that's a different uh, a different thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I like that in the movie too. Just kind of the role reversals, where you have the hunters and then uh, they become the hunted. And also, I think uh, with uh, people where. It's kind of like you would think they're civilized, and uh, throughout the movie they have to become uh, wild or, or brutal themselves to uh, to try to you know survive this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the the small character arc is uh, you know civilized as I think we are. Um, we're we're a few situations or circumstances away from again kind of fall back to that that title primal. I, that's kind of how I came up with the primal rage. I, I know it's. Uh, it's an old arcade game, but the word primal just kept getting thrown around so much. I was like, I got to find a way to use this in the title. But uh, that's just it is, you know, you're thrown into some circumstances and, and the elements are, are at you. You kind of become, you know, everything gets stripped away from you. You, get a, you literally be, become a primitive being. And it's, that's like the, you know, the way to survive. It's your, it's your last way to survive. And, and that's what it takes for, you know, the, the characters become the ones that at least make it near the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't, you know, there's a lot of things in the movie, like I just mentioned, you know, that you can uh, look past just the Bigfoot, but I also want people to know the Bigfoot itself is awesome and uh, very brutal kills. All the effects are amazing. I assume it's all practical effects. Yeah. That was, that was the driving force. The big motivating factor for me originally was, um, to just kind of develop my own film and, and, and throw as much practical effects in there as possible and have to have control over a, what, what we were being asked to make and then uh, B how they would be utilized and then C ultimately, cause it's always disappointing when you work on a lot of movies and you get through A and B and then they, you know, an editor gets their hands on it and next thing you know, so something's cut out and all that and, and you're left with nothing. And, I I wanted to kind of go through all the motions to have total control. So, uh, you know, I answer your question. Everything was practical. I do have I do have some an amazing visual effects supervisor, and uh, there are I think I ended up with uh, seventy digital effects 
mostly mm -hmm. two-dimensional imagery used for signage and atmosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a little bit snuck in there as far as uh, helping aid the practical effects. You know, I, I, I'd like anybody to find out where it is. I mean, it's hidden so well. But uh, mm -hmm. I definitely still use digital technology to my advantage, uh, but, but in a very okay. small way, limited way. And, and that, was a, that was a whole other approach to making this film and approaching it from a practical effect standpoint. It was more about just being practical in general. And uh, the, the films I, I grew up with, the films I'm a fan of, um, were obviously practical effects film. They didn't have, uh, you know, the late 70s, early 80s. They didn't have uh, digital effects. They had visual effects. But um, I feel to kind of fall back on um, the strengths of the limits of practical effects and really realize as we would set up shots and, and use certain camera moves and techniques or whether it be someone getting shot or the OMA suit itself is to really realize that the limitations of the practical effects could be to our benefit. And I think, you know, we've all heard the story about Jaws and the shark not working and then so it becomes a fin and sure. all that kind of stuff, you know, benefits the movie. And so I really, really wanted to make sure I didn't uh, just have tons of carnage and gore and just do practical effects to do practical practical effects, but to actually capitalize on, you know, limits of it and then to kind of hold back and then with the edit be really minimal with it as well as far as what we show, even though I think we probably show a lot. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, there, I for me, just uh, watching uh, uh, practical effects, there's uh, something about the weight i don't think you can ever duplicate in uh with a uh, with a cg it's even if you don't aren't aware of it i think there just seems something off about it like the weight's not there yeah and that's a that's a constant conversation and um and it's getting there and sometimes it gets there too too well for me it makes me really nervous when you watch these new planet of the apes movies um right. but i think the, the other thing though from uh producing perspective or even just the director's perspective is that this type of story needed to and easily warrants being told with you know old school practical effects a guy in a suit you know that's what the story i think mm -hmm. deserves uh, i think too it, it doesn't i don't think it would do anything better if i had you know millions of dollars to spend on super high-end you know digital technology to make a computer generated anything i i don't know if it helps the story it doesn't wasn't what we yeah. were i was you know intending to do and and it also mm -hmm. without a doubt what was what was just really cool was you know we shot up at the the oregon california border and when you're in a bigfoot suit and then you're in that awesome <laughs> environment i mean it's right uh -huh. there so there's no de no denying he exists in that moment and so mm -hmm. for all the performers when when they meet him you know it you're in the environment he's right in front of you there's no not too much to make believe <laughs> yeah so uh how did you find that area to, to, to shoot in did you have to search for a lot of different places it it was a small evolution i lucked out i had a co-worker um actually film another film movie up in that area and she had sent me some pictures knowing i'd had this project i'd already started developing this project and the pictures were amazing. And uh, so I just set out, I think it was just like the year after those pictures when I had some free time. And I went in the in the new year when the weather was crummy. And I went up and I just scouted the place for an entire week. And it was like sold instantly the minute I was there. And then did a little bit more research and found out in the particular area where the Redwoods were, this is where they shot Return of the Jedi with the Ewoks. And then they had shot... Uh, a lot of the forest for ET and, and then a few other movies, I, you know, the new um, Jaden Smith movie, I think uh, M night Shyamalan is all that kind of look of the woods. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, and I think they do a lot of car commercials up there, but I was, I was sold the minute I was up there. The size of the, the trees is just amazing. Yeah. Now, I know when I talked to Marshall, he said that you had had planned uh, for it to be like raining uh, when you did the, when you did the shots, is that true? And, uh, kind of like we were talking about earlier about the, with the practical things, you know, maybe not sometimes if something doesn't work out the way you thought, 
how did that change the movie at all? And was it for the better or anything? Yeah, an- another one of another another film that's a big influence, or at least on the look and, and some of the characters, is uh, First Blood, the the first mm-hmm. Rambo movie. And uh, I just love the look of that forest and how wet and cold it was. And um, they shot that in Canada. I didn't have enough financing to get get us all the way up there. Uh-huh. But every time I went purposely to go scout at this location i went in january and february and it was of course always rainy and wet mm-hmm. and so it looked looked that part and we even took the the creature suit up there and did some test photography in there and, and it was nice the weather was nice and behaving poorly <laughs> and and gave us that great rain look and then go figure when it came the year to actually go shoot <laughs> um they had a record um uh, i guess you would say a heat wave where we were 70 to 75 degrees and, you know, sunshine. And it, I hadn't been there like that in 40 years there and for the months of February. So <laughs> that, I mean, you got to just go. Uh, we had long lunches, essentially. The forest made a great kind of canopy over everything, mm-hmm. which was another reason we were there. But uh, between, you know, 11 and 2, in the afternoon, 11 a.m. and 2, you know, the sun was just hitting out and we get all this hard light coming in through certain areas. So I really wanted to avoid that in the look, especially because we had shot some stuff already and we had lucked out on some overcast days. And I just really wanted to avoid any hard sunlight coming in. So we took like long lunch breaks and shot like crazy early in the morning and then shot crazy in the afternoon, late late afternoon when the sun was, you know, taking the corner and, and the light was nice and moody in there. So this is one of those things you re- you realize you gotta you gotta deal with, <laughs> there <it is. laughs> especially when you're outside in the elements. Uh huh. So so a lot of people might not notice I uh, know this because I didn't know it until I talked to Marshall that you also play uh, Bigfoot in the movie, and you just mentioned it was 75 degrees. So how hot was it in the uh, in in the suit? Yeah, that was another big decision. I you know it took me so long. I was financing the the build of the suit itself, and you know. I only had so much time um, to invest into it, you know, each month of the year. So I realized quickly I'm, I'm six foot eight and I played, I played, uh, I played a predator before and a couple of things. And oh, cool. I was actually the predator in the, like the teaser trailer for the first AVP. And so I've been in some suits and I played zombies before and done that. And I just started to realize, you know, I think I got to build this thing on myself because I'm the tallest person I know. And I'm, I knew I was going to be the most available <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> when needed. And then, um, yeah, I thought for sure, Hey, when we get up shooting and it's nice and f- frosty cold and it's raining, I'm going to be in this nice warm suit while everyone else is freezing. And of course, well, the weather became warm and that wasn't the case. So I was just cooking in there. <laughs> so that was fun. And that was really interesting to, obviously I knew it was, it was going to be another big hurdle. And I had to explain that to some of the, you know, the performers is that, yeah, we got to stop the camera, rewind, and let me look through the monitor and let me see what certain takes were. And that was the most trouble was, you know, being in the, the suit and directing and then, you know, watching <laughs> other people do what they're doing was fine. But I was getting really upset with myself. I would see how I would do a certain move and like, oh, wait a minute. OK, I'm doing this all wrong. And so some mm-hmm. of the longer takes or multiple takes were actually on the Bigfoot itself because, I'd actually watch what I was doing to then correct myself. So that made it, made it fun, fun and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, from being the Bigfoot to director, um, I, I guess you kept most of the suit on, but what were, I, I guess you had to take some of it off. Like how, how did that work? Just like physically. Well, it literally became, you know, you don't see him much for most, you know, most of the movie, there's mm-hmm. just certain scenes where you see them a lot. So we would schedule it and I would, you know, so I would basically be prepared for out oh, today. I had a couple long suit days. And when I went in, I'd stay in and I didn't, li- I don't like taking things off and then letting them get all cold and they're, they're already wet from sweat and everything. So I don't like taking things off and then you know, an hour later, putting it back on. So I, I typically just left everything on the whole time, even with the, the contact lenses. So I, I, I'd be able to see, though, fine through the mask and all, and then look at the monitor. 
So you'd have, you know, it's real easy to make Bigfoot a comedy, <laughs> comedy movie. And, you know, I uh-huh. could probably uh, edit a whole comedy version of this film based on outtakes and certain things. But yeah, I, I directed entire scenes with the whole suit on and there's Bigfoot pointing to the left and pointing to the right and looking at the camera and monitor and coming around camera <laughs> and barking orders. And you're kind of getting a muffled sound through the mask. And that's just kind of the way you got to do it. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So, uh, so when you're d- developing the suit, um, I, cause you said you, you weren't, when did you decide you were going to play Bigfoot? I know you kind of went over that, but I would think when you're designing the suit, do you have to have someone, uh, to, to put it on while you're making it? Or is it made that it would, it wouldn't have to fit someone, you know, the exact size? Yeah. The, the, the original intention was to make, when I started out with this film was, okay, I want to make, I want to make a cool Bigfoot. I want to do everything the way, the proper way, which we would consider proper in in the effects business and build underlying muscles and have multiple gloves and different heads and all, you know, it takes a lot of time to do all that and put all the hairs in individually. And I originally had designed him first with miniature stuff and had the intention of not wanting to wear it. And, uh, but I didn't want to compromise on the height. I wanted to find somebody really tall. And honestly, a lot of the great creature performers, they're not super tall guys these days. They're not the Kevin Peter Hall that was in Predator and Harry Henderson's. Not that I would have had the budget or, you know, to, to acquire somebody like that. Maybe I could have, if they were, you know, as a, as a, a favor. And I quickly just realized, you know, Hey, I'm six, eight i just got to do it on myself and hey when i try it on the glove i'm right there i can try it on so i started with the head and hands and built it piece by piece and then yeah when you're done with all the elements i basically had to turn to my crew which i had a crew of four constantly and they would uh help me get in this thing this thing fits so snugly and tightly you know you got to zipper up the bag with a corset built into it and then a zipper and snaps and you got to you know, snap on the head and then the, the way the hands going and the feet, it takes, a, definitely takes two people to get, get me in this thing. And it took, you know, up to 30 minutes to get everything snapped together and put in properly. And then we had certain parts on the mask where they're um, servo driven with little motors. So you got a battery pack coming down off your neck into the hunch of the suit and you got to jam those in there and you're switching out batteries and it's a, it's a lot to do. And having done it, and already, you know, I knew it was a lot to do getting into it, but really having done it, you know, it's very apparent why there are not a lot of Bigfoot movies. <laughs> it's because <laughs> it's a real pain in the butt. You know, it takes a lot of time to make it, and it's a lot of time to just manage it and handle it as far as the special effects side of it. Yeah. Uh, for, the for like, the camouflage, you know, like, I don't want to give a lot away from the movie, but the camouflage is awesome. And uh, are, are those two different suits, or is the camouflage made to go mm-hmm. over the uh, the actual suit itself? Yeah, I um, I wanted to get away with one suit just because so much work. But then when we initially uh, did the test, I did some test stuff in it. I realized all the camouflage started rubbing on the suit in certain areas, and so I realized I needed a second suit. Um, granted, the parts come off and on like they would any kind of the way they look. Um, and that was an evolutionary thing too. I, I actually had zero intentions of doing anything like that. And that was actually the co-writer Jay Lee's idea. idea. He, uh, I remember him sending me pages and I remember reading you know, this elaborate description of his intricate, you know, flora and all this plant stuff and everything all over his body. And I, I got really upset because <laughs> I was like, damn, now I got to make all this on top of the big foot suit. <laughs> so I kind of took what he had, which was very elaborate and kind of streamlined it to keep it a little simple. And then I, you know, I resisted it at first. And then after more thought, I thought, well, we'll give him a mask. That's kind of cool. And then, it, you know, it kind of falls into that predator category. And then I could, you know, without giving too much away, the way it's designed, the way he's able to manage it, it, it kind of works to where, wow, he can blend in. And then it just instantly kind of snapped and thought, you know, that's what kind of elevated the the thought process on the, our, our take on Bigfoot is that it kind of makes sense. Like, you know, yeah. I, there were moments where you blend in and it's like, you have no clue something's there. Wow. Yeah. They're smart enough to be like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I was so going to say, it, 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 it makes, it makes sense with the legend itself because there's always a part of it is, you know, 
Uh, if it's so big, why can't people find it? And then you have the camouflage. It just kind of yeah adds a level of uh, actually realism to the uh, to the character. <laughs> I think so, and it's kind of a why not? It just started to it just started to make sense to me and Gel, and it just made it made it cool, and then it kind of fell into that, that again that predator vibe. Yeah, a new take on it. So, mm-hmm. but I, I really I really like that idea of um, a monster wearing a mask, and then the mask can come off. I mean, that's always worked well with all the slasher films and obviously some other monsters. I just think that's kind of an, it's just a, it's a traditional idea, but it's a neat idea. Yeah. Yeah. I like that too. Um, where did you meet Jay Lee? How did you, uh, how did you get, uh, how did you get to work with him? Uh, I met Jay Lee. That's a long story. Um, but I was working, everything kind of is connected. I was working on a film and the director, um, that I was working with on that. I ended up going to his house on the weekend because he was doing an aside, like a little short film. This is when iPhones were blowing up big and he was doing little 60 second shorts. And I went to his house to discuss something. And there was a gal there that saw my portfolio and said, Hey, I know uh, I have some friends that are making a small horror movie like in two weeks or 10 days. And would you be interested in helping? And I thought, I'll give him my number. Or I'll call. And I ended up meeting um angela lee jay's sister at their place and they had a production company and they um jay had done uh, his main thing at that time he had i think he had directed a film he had done some shorts for sure but they were a company that did uh short reels for new actors and would edit and film and do you know they do fake scenes and stuff to help new actors get their their reels going and so they had accumulated all these contacts and all these performers and it got to the point with them where they were like, Hey, let's just, we're just going to make a movie. And so I, I came in and helped them on their first horror movie and did a bunch of blood and guts and quick stuff, you know, fast. That was like 2005. And uh, they sold that movie quickly and it went to blockbuster video. And then from that they did, uh, he got zombie strippers and wrote that and then helped with that. And so I, you know, I've known him, 13 years now and uh he's done a couple other movies since and he's always helped me and he is he's great he's one of those guys you know i've worked on a lot of i've worked for other big companies on big films and been on a you know a few really large sets which are amazing and i've worked on a lot of independent films and kind of middle of the road films and jay was one of those guys kind of a triple threat where and I was really impressed quickly with, you know, he's writing content and then he's, he, he shoots his own stuff and then he edits as well. And then he is the director and uh, he really picked up quickly on um, what practical effects were and what it kind of took. And, and a lot of directors I think are hit and miss, but he was really quick to understand how, um, you know, a practical effect, you know, no matter how much you plan and rehearse, sometimes, you know, you just got to shoot it a bunch of times or try different. You got to just kind of figure it out. And it's not a, okay, we're going to put the camera here and it's going to, the head's going to do this and then we're done. And we just, we're going to do two because we have two heads. It, it usually never just works that way. And I, I found out really quickly that Jay understood that and was like all about experimenting and trying and giving, you know, giving shots an extra, an extra try. So we, we just kind of, I think bonded really quickly early and always got along and kind of had the same mind frame. Um, and so he's always, he's always, uh, we've always worked together. And so when I presented him my project, he was, he was uh, all, all on board. And that was great because without a doubt could not have pulled off this project, especially being in the suit without having a guy that's so familiar with the content who co-wrote it. And then have him be the DP. There were so many instances where it was like, I just have to look at him and go, we got it. We got it. But, you know, and this, that, and the other, he, he really covered me. So he's my, definitely my right hand wingman back pocket, everything. He's the true, true backbone to this project as well. Yeah. Now let's hear your first, uh, first uh, feature you directed. Did you direct anything before that? Like shorts or anything? I haven't directed anything official as far as short. I, I would consider myself a, a mini director as far as dealing with effect sequences and scenarios or scenes within a, you know, within films. Um, you know, when you, you know, develop certain gags or setups for, for films with effects, you're kind of, you know, you're a director in, in your own. You got to understand how, how to, how things cut and what's going to work and what's not. So, 
Um, I have, yeah, I haven't done anything, I guess, officially at all as far as the director's reel other than this film. So uh, going into that, uh, what were some of the things, I assume just, you know, watching other people direct on movies, you pick up certain things, but what were some of the things uh, that you didn't expect once you started doing it that, that may have been a hard or more challenging? Well, yeah, I've watched a lot of directors. Um, pay, just paying attention a lot got me into this. And then, uh, you know, every everything you can get your hands on. I, you know, I've listened to a lot. You know, you listen to a lot of directors' commentaries on other films. Uh-huh. And I actually, I read, a, I read a ton of books. The Just every and any book that's been published on making films and directing really helped a lot. Um, definitely, I was, uh, I was shitting bricks first few days just to make sure i knew how to you know like when we just to shoot a scene that didn't have any effects that's where i was a little nervous because like okay all right there's no no fake (laughs) body there's no really yeah you know you're so used to showing up on set with the big cool fun thing and everyone gets excited on set for that but it's like no we're just gonna shoot a talky talk scene right here so okay (laughs) (laughs) so uh just really kind of analyzing all the films I like and styles and approaches to certain looks. And again, we referenced Predator and First Blood and all these, you know, big A movies, but even, you know, smaller movies, just trying to kind of fall into what, I, as far as the style that I liked and then uh, just being prepared for that. So um, it, it seemed natural. It definitely seemed natural. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, for people who don't know, I know you, you reference a bunch of times doing special effects and makeup on another movie. That's what you you did before uh, uh, directing Primal Rage. Um, how did you get into that? I know you mentioned Harry and the Hendersons. You know, watching is that really the movie that like inspired you to pursue like a uh, uh, work in makeup and special effects? I um, I grew up at a time. I grew up in where movies of the you know I was I think I was seven years old and I saw American World from London. Mm-hmm. on hbo and uh i kind of follow the, the the greatest transformation <laughs> scene ever yeah absolutely <laughs> i mean no, i the the concept for that movie is really interesting and that movie really really caught my eye of a young seven-year-old i probably saw it a little too young but i'm kind of this it's almost a generic story at this point for a lot of sex people my age within that five-year bracket where we all saw American Wolf Lennon and it kind of just captivate, captivate you at this right age. And then it's followed up by thriller and then making of thriller. And that's really kind of steals the deal where it's like shows and explains everything that's happening and how they're doing it all. So it's like kind of wraps it all up in a bow and the president would just hand it right to me. It was like, okay, I really like this. And I found it as a, uh, it was just a hobby. I was always really into drawing monsters, just like any other kind of monster kid. And, after a while you realize all I'm doing is drawing monsters and making stuff out of pie dough. And when Halloween would come around, you'd grab anything you could get at Halloween time. And then in my teens, I realized I got into the Fangoria magazines and all that. Then you see ads for suppliers of special effects stuff. So then it was like, okay, let me get a, let me buy, let me get a, this is back when you pay you like $3 and you get a catalog for (laughs) effects supplies. And then I'd read all, I'd study the, the catalogs for supplies and then, be brave and bold enough to spend whatever money I had on certain materials. And then just realized by the time I was in my late teens, um, I think that this is a profession I think I need to to go after. And I was, I'm six, eight. So I was also always um, played basketball a lot. And I went to college. I did two years of college and I got a scholarship and basketball was kind of always the, the forefront runner for me as well just because I could get, you know, I had schooling paid for me. And I ended up dropping out just to pursue uh, my real true love, which was this makeup effects. And so I'd had, by the time I was 18, 19, I realized I had had kind of a uh, built my own portfolio at that point on my own blood and guts and a couple masks and even some fiberglass things. I know the, the Tom Savini, those, he had these grand illusion books. Those were a big influence on me as well. With those, I uh, came out to L.A., and back then, this is when you would just look in the yellow pages and look up special makeup effects in, in the in the valley, and uh-huh. I think there were 10 shops listed, and 
I know I went to one of the shops that sells special effects and I said, Hey, so I'm new here and I, I got this stuff and I want to start. And they, I showed them my list and they said, you should go try Screaming Mad George. So I basically called Screaming Mad George. who's kind of a, he's a, he's an old icon in the special yeah. makeup effects world. Um, he goes back to Nightmare on Elm Street 4 with the cockroach scene and the old boss film studios. He did effects for Poltergeist 2 and Big Trouble in Little China and Cocoon. So anyway, I started there and I started working with him and that was actually uh, 20 years ago. That's pretty awesome. So uh, I remember those, the, the I had a Tom Savini uh, uh, book when I was a kid. I remember... It was. It told you it was like cornflakes or something. Was uh, how he did. Like uh, I think the the the, uh, the father in uh, in uh, in Father's Day in Creepshow. But uh, yeah, he uh, texturized. He had sculpted like the skull type mask, and then he just started adding latex and cornflakes or Rice Krispies, and then he <laughs> weeds and whatever you can get your hand on. And it was a, yeah, yeah. Those were great books, and it was a great. He has a great mentality as far as you know. Do what's again, and do what's practical, and it's kind of like, yeah, let's just go get some weeds. He would be, <laughs> you know, covered in weeds. We'll just go get weeds and glue them on. Nothing's gonna look better yeah. than that. <laughs> yeah, when I, I'd interview him one time, which is, was uh, you know a huge, uh, huge thing for me to interview Tom Sweeney. And I always remember he said so much. I always thought it was cool. He said uh, before, like when you were learning to do this stuff. Before there were just like, you know, ways how you do whatever. That was the most fun he had was just like discovering new ways to make things like that. Like, you know, finding Rice Krispies to put in something. Absolutely. And um, we've kind of gotten away from that. I mean, that was what was, I think, so fun about that time. And then movies of that time um, is you're kind of always put in a bind where you're challenging yourself, but that, that what makes things fun and interesting. And sometimes the simplest things are like the, you know, the easiest way to solve problems, but it, you're, you're constant, you're in a constant problem solving mind frame. And unfortunately now everything's just so processed where it's like, Hey, you know, and that was another, I mean, that was actually probably my number one motivating factor for doing this film or a film in general was I just got so frustrated with, okay, here's our script and here we go, and and then you read it, and then, you know, here's the next slice, and here's this, this kind of prototypical thing, and then here's $10, and we're, we're shooting it next week. And it's like, well, this that's not right. This isn't fun, and this isn't, you know, there's nothing, there's no new uh-huh. challenge. And that's kind of where I'd gotten with so many things is that, you know, everything can, is getting kind of checked in. And those days of kind of really pushing and trying to do, you know, discover some new things or twists and turns, and then you know, push with practical effects, you know, now, I mean, it is easy. And I don't think I didn't do anything on this film where, you know, you can have a, a green arm or a green rod or some green or blue would, would be in my case that you can digitally remove things to help. And, and I'm all for that, but um, it's just a mind frame that goes with it. And it's apparent. You can see it in those olden films, which I think are looked at so fondly compared to some of the new flashy stuff now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned some movies uh, uh, already that you liked, but uh, what were some, what are some of your favorite horror movies? Well, American Werewolf was the one that really caught me. Um, I love Predator. Uh, I love Alien and Aliens. That's a constant battle. And I love the howling. It's kind of funny with effects people or, or film people in general, and I think it just comes down to timing. You used to be able to ask, okay, the Howling or American Werewolf in London, and you'd usually get to, you know, someone would have to choose a side. And I honestly, uh-huh. I lean on American Werewolf in London, but I love the Howling too, of course. And then I love Aliens a little bit more than Alien. You're in, they're totally different, two different styles of movies. I love mm-hmm. Predator. Um, another one I saw when I was young, and, it, and it's always stuck with me, and it's an odd one, is um, Psycho Part Two, the sequel. I think it's a very mm-hmm. underrated movie. Um, always like that. I love all the classics, the Halloween, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Fog, um, all those classics. Um, I, I love the original Psycho as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, all those kind of throwback movies that they keep, we're, we're still talking about and remaking. <laughs> and right, remaking sequels, sequels <laughs> right, yeah. Right, rebooting, direct sequels to the first one, yeah. 
Uh... Yeah, I love uh, I love um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Francis Ford Coppola. I think that's that's a great movie if you just watch it from a practical effects standpoint, not just makeup, but the way the camera tricks and illusions and everything is in camera. It's such a phenomenal movie to watch and realize that they they handcuffed themselves and tried to do as minimal as they could without uh, computer imagery. Um, I think that's a fun film. Yeah, my favorite um, part yeah. of that is actually the, the beginning with the shadows uh, when he's in the castle, when he's the old Dracula. Uh, yeah, just, and it's so... Cool about yeah, the, the, the... <laughs> yeah, it's got a retro vibe and they're like little cutouts and they're, you know, there's people underneath that stage just jerking around. But it's just, it's a, it's a vibe and a feel that you, you get. And um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so when you're doing Primal Rage, uh, how hands-on were you for the casting of the movie? Well, I mean, I was hands-on with casting myself. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> right, right. as the as the script developed, you know, he, it it became so much more than originally intended. I wanted the movie to be um, just about a couple. Then you realize, well, there's there's only so much you can do, and I wanted to utilize more of my skill with special effects and, you know, you need a body count on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so the whole element with the hunters came in and um, when it was all finished and written, you just kind of, you break down, you're like, okay, eight hunters. And you look at what each one of them's doing. And then, um, you know, I had known most of all those guys. Actually, I think I, I absolutely, I know all of those guys, when I was developing the project with the exception of Marshall Hilton, the, the lead guy. Mm-hmm. So I had known all them from other projects. Uh, a couple of them are uh, effects guys that I've worked with for years. Another group are improv actors that work at universal studios where I had done a lot of projects there and I knew they would bring it and they were all live improv actors. So I knew um, they, they could add so much more to it. And I also have, you known them, for so long i knew they'd show up on my little limited budget and i also knew they'd show up after a certain period of time from uh, molding them and making all the reproductions of them a year in advance and then saying hey remember you know we could do your hair this way like we had planned it that way and kind of having enough time to prepare that so for this project i called in every single favor of you know at that time 17 18 years of working in the business I called on everybody and said, this is the plan. And it was a favor after a favor after a favor. So all, oh, most of those hunters. And then the guy in the, the, the grocery store, Matt Harold, I had known him. Uh, he's, he's a big comedy actor. Uh, and then my two leads I had known for several years as well. And um, so I, I kind of knew everybody and was able to place them as we wrote. And then uh, basically did a traditional casting for BD for Marshall Hilton. Mm-hmm. And even he, he wasn't uh, coming, deciding on him wasn't, he wasn't the exact look and feel I was actually going for, for that character. But when he read, um, he sold me. I said, that's our BD. Um, he kind of took it in a little bit different direction than I had originally intended. And so he, he won his, his position real well. And, uh, he, he does a phenomenal job in that role. He's got a lot of, he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of say in in that position. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the other element, uh, the other kind of secondary story with the the native American element was the, the sheriff and the deputy. And we did a full on casting for them. And I looked at a lot of people. We hired a casting director for those, those two positions. And I looked at, tons and tons and tons of people for both those positions Mm -hmm. and uh, lucked out with both with Eloy Casados, who's, I don't know how many, he's got to have at least 70 credits, but he goes back to like white men can't jump and a lot of character roles in in older films. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then with Justin rain as the deputy, um, he just really stood out in the pack as far as all the people that were looking at for that. And turns out, you know, he got uh, Fear the Walking Dead since then. So he, he's kind of taken off. He was on the TV <laughs> show Defiance. Uh-huh. So he's a he's got himself a little niche going. Yeah. So the the Native American aspect um, that wasn't originally part of it. When did that come about? And like, uh, who whose idea was to add that to it? Was it yours or Jay's it, or a combination? It 
It was always there. I always knew I wanted to to present um, Bigfoot with a, a native, I guess you could say, legend background to it. Mm -hmm. I actually, I grew up um, in Vancouver, Canada for a good chunk of my youth and was always kind of surrounded by native culture. And I I remember doing field trips and always seeing this stuff. And I remember, um, you know, every kind of culture has a, what they call a hominid, you know, a two-legged beast. And, you know, if you're in Asia, they have, you know, in the snow, you got the Yeti, you know, everyone has a name for it. And I remember hearing something about Oma. And that was the the native name for for the Sasquatch. So I'd always kind of that was always intended to give it that background history, but to take it to where we did was not the intention because I wasn't sure about how to do it. And again, I only knew what my resources were at the time. So uh, Jay Jay brought a lot. Jay did a lot of history. Jay definitely added he added the peyote uh, sequence in the film and got me connected with Jackie uh, Neiman Jones who really helped with that and I guess you could say was a consultant on the peyote scene and how that whole element works and then really really contributed to the to the Native American element as far as making you know helping with that legend with what that Oma was Mm -hmm. no um for the layer of the Bigfoot where was that film I assume it was a different location than the rest of the movie yeah, I, sh- I got to shoot that locally. We shot uh, the lair um, in L.A., and that was a set that was built and uh, resurrected just for that. You know, I tried to find the... That's the other tricky thing about being an artist is you get so stuck in your head at drawing what I thought the cave needs to be, and I I found a couple local things, but they were too big. I just couldn't, couldn't see past what it was they were showing me, and I wanted to have a fire in there and do a lot of fire stuff, so... I realized I just had to make this thing. <laughs> so that was built locally. Yeah. It looks awesome. All the, all the different little, a lot of details in it, which, which, uh, you know, adds a lot, obviously. There's, there's a lot. And there's, unfortunately, there's a lot more that in there that you don't see as soon as it gets dark <laughs> right. and, and you cut your movie. It's like, we, you know, we shot so many inserts and I realized this is not a movie called the inserts, <laughs> but there's so many things in there. I wish that that were that you could see that you just don't. Yeah. On a, on a personal note, I do want to mention, uh, my uncle Barry passed away, uh, just a few weeks actually before I saw this movie. And it's too bad. Cause he was a huge Bigfoot, uh, fan. And I heard the story a million times back, uh, when he lived in Pennsylvania, when they were kids, uh, my grandmother told the story. They said they think they saw a Bigfoot up in the mountain, and uh, him and his brother, my other uncle, they went up and found the the cave where they were where he was supposedly at, and they heard something, and then they ran home and and uh, <laughs> didn't go back. But it would have been I would have liked to watch a movie with him and for him to see the layer of, uh, <laughs> of the Bigfoot and I would have asked him if it was anything like uh, he remembers. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's another thing too. It's again, you know, when you you look at the history of these Bigfoot movies and you, or you start thinking about Bigfoot and everyone has their ideas of where they live, but you've never really seen one, I think in a film. So I thought oh, it'd be cool to show like some cool kind of secluded hidden cave lair where one, one of these guys might be. And that's something I don't, I'm sure has, but I had, I don't recall seeing a specific place where they've lived at least set up the way he is. I mean, he had a good feng shui in there. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what about like the making of the actual the, the the tools like uh uh how how does that how how does that go about what are like the th- the thought process um very primitive well you know there's a, I don't and you know in this trailer I, they don't show everything he can do so I don't want to announce too many of yeah, what he's got yeah. but uh. Mm-hmm. I had I got books on Native American weapons. I got a couple of really cool ones on um, fighting techniques and weapons and all the certain Native American tool making things. And I basically approached it that way. And uh, there were some really cool museums I went to. Some of them I bought. I got this really awesome blade, real obsidian blade for a knife. And then the handle is a real uh, jaw jawbone from a wolf. Mm-hmm. So I bought a couple of these things and then I had seen some of these other things in museums and just kind of took pictures and replicated them. Um, and basically 
kind of, you just kind of hand make everything just like a primitive cave tool. Just, you know, I approached it kind of like predator at the end where Schwarzenegger's been making those, uh, Unre- you know, unnoticeable weapons. He had his certain mm-hmm. things he was making there. I was like, I just could approach it like that. That's what he maybe do. Yeah. Um, no, I did. Yeah, all of them look sweet. Was it to say? Was I did not watch the trailer. I went right into the movie without knowing pretty much anything about it besides the basic premise. So I don't know if there's. I don't want to mention it, but there is another uh, um, kind of a supernatural character in the movie. And so I don't know if that's even in the trail or anything that people would know, but, uh, what was, uh, uh, when did that come about? When, when was that added to the story? Well, we're talking about her, her, yes, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That she came in a little bit later and, um, just kind of developing the script and the basic outline. And again, just reading a lot of movies on script writing and paying attention to the movies I liked. I realized, um, a lot of the films I really like and enjoy in general, they always have these cool secondary characters show up in the end of the second act that were kind of out of nowhere. And it was like, who's this? And they're typically were usually a cool looking character or something like that. And um, again, I, you know, I just realized what would be an interesting little twist or another added element. And then of course it ends up being a, a big effects one where uh, I thought, you know what, this is, I'm going to try this too. So uh, the person I cast for that role looks nothing like her and is somebody I'd known for years as well. <laughs> that's, I, I remember, good. that's good for that person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good for that person. But I remember uh, <laughs> talking with Jay and he's like, he suggested her and he's like, yeah, so yeah. And I was like, are you sure? And he's like, I know the performance wise she can do it. And she did. She nailed it. But uh, it just, it was another layer. And I, you know, I think to make it a little more cool and interesting. And then it's still, um, I'm very aware it's a throwback to some other characters in that same vein to some other classic uh, horror movies as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, no, I'm not in, you know, the most original territory at all, but it's a new twist on something we're all familiar with. And I try to, ha- I try to have her uh, do, do things differently. This character we're talking about. Yeah, I was a big fan. It totally works for me. I, I think she's fun, and and it's it's yeah. If you don't watch the trailer, and if you're not prepared for it, it's almost a whoa. Who's this? What's this all yeah. about? <laughs> really, if you can watch a movie without ever seeing the trailer or really know much about it, it, is the best way to watch a movie. I think it's fun just to go in and not know anything about it, and you're you know you're totally Absolutely. surprised. Absolutely, but that's incredibly risky these days. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it is. yeah it's, it's hard to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if you're going to go to the theater and stuff. By the way, the theater, uh, the Fathom event for it on uh, the 27th, can uh, can you explain what people will, will get out of that? Because it's not just the movie. Yeah, we're, you know, it's funny. I screened this thing a year ago on a big screen, and I'd seen it a couple times before on a big screen, and we got a really good, uh, the, the music is phenomenal. I got to mention Kerry Torgerson. I always butcher his last name. He is a phenomenal composer, and I really lucked out with the composer on this film. Between his score and the sound design, and watching it play big, I uh, you know, I was really impressed, and I thought this movie might actually do well on a big screen. Like it plays really well with the sound, and uh, I'm very fortunate to get this Fathom event release. And um, what they're doing with that is you obviously see the movie. um, And then when it's over, we did, we edited together a 15, 20 minute little making of reel to kind of hit some quick bullet points on obviously mostly the practical effects and performance and shooting in the elements and just gives you a quick behind the behind the scenes look. Um, So that, you know, it would be like a little featurette on your DVD essentially is what you're getting. I'd love to do something a little bit more elaborate, which I think we are for the DVD release or even digital release. We're going to do a a bigger version. I think the film warrants that. We have so much behind the scenes to do on that. But you get to see a good 15, 20 minutes after the movie. And there's a couple of amazing stories. Mm-hmm. There's a couple other amazing stories. Um, just most of this film was shot. I actually have four separate years of footage in the film, but for the most part, it was shot within two years. We shot in February of 2015, and then February of 
2016. And there's an interesting story in between that, between one of my lead actors. And I'd actually leave it at that and say, you're going to hear, go, go see it in the movie and hear the story. Cause it's really amazing story on this guy's journey to, to um, real life live and mm-hmm. interesting decision he had to make for his, his own uh, certain living I guess you could say situation based on an accident he had. Oh, wow. They're interesting. And there's something special uh, for me. Or, or I think most people love movies about seeing uh, on the big screen. It's right there in front of you. And then you mentioned the sound. I think the, a special movie like this, that would definitely add a lot to the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, we went out, we went out of our way to get and shoot it in this awesome forest with big trees and it's um i tried to work in as much kind of pretty scenic stuff as possible so visually it feels it looks big feels big and then yeah to hear it with the proper sound uh, i highly encourage it um again i'm i want to say i'm my worst critic and there's a lot of things i can cringe at but (laughs) just seeing it play big i you know just the sound alone and and some of the visuals I, i was i was very 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 pleased with the the work done by by those those members of the the crew. Mm-hmm. And uh, if uh, I'm not this, I hope this. If this is too much spoiler, let me know. I'll edit out here. But uh, just for people who are into uh, effects and gore and everything, for me, hands down, the best uh, face rip scene I've ever seen in a movie. Yep, that was uh, that was number one um, kill on my list. It, I've always been fascinated with that. There's a whole new twist on that taking it to the next level i think uh-huh. where it's like stage two yeah. it's a it's a throwback to the old king kong movies and all the kind of beast movies that, that have been out there through the years and um i think uh that was you know if if you're a fan of horror movies and you're a fan of carnage and stuff happening if you can't like if, if you can't appreciate that then i failed <laughs> <laughs> right yeah like i want to say because i there's part of me that just likes that just the gore and the, the craziness but it's also a good movie so it's it's a it's a best of both worlds oh great uh, i appreciate that yeah so uh how could people follow uh you and follow the movie online I, I'm a big fan of Instagram. So I'm on Instagram as Maggie FX, M-A-G-E-E, like Maggie, Maggie, Maggie FX. Mm -hmm. Uh, I post on Instagram quite frequently. Uh, Primal Rage Movie is on Instagram. Uh, I don't do much on Facebook or Twitter, even though I probably link them all from Instagram, but Instagram is my big one. And then Primal Rage Movie on Instagram as well and i know primal rage has a facebook page that seems to be moving pretty good right here Mm -hmm. very cool and uh do you you, um anything uh would you ever revisit uh the movie would you ever do a sequel or possibly spin off i guess oh absolutely you got to watch what happens i mean you saw it you saw you saw how this thing ends um mm-hmm. yeah i'm ready to go i'm ready to do uh, I'm, I'm hoping something happens here and i would love to i've i have so many more ideas um you know again requires requires a few more dollars but i, I would mm-hmm. i would love to further this uh, story cool and uh, not just because you, you're here i i really did love the movie and uh, I, I'm, I look forward to your future projects. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing it. That's been great. Hey, this is Brian Steele. You're listening to Without Your Head, the Creature Boy, Without Your Head. <laughs>